Welcome to Serious Business on NDTV. 30 minutes of hard business news. One topic, one speaker, and a conversation that's relevant to you. I'm Manvi Sinha Dhillon. COVID has emphasized like never before the need for quality health care in India. Medical awareness has increased. Preventive health testing has increased. Overall, the demand for quality health care has increased. While government spending on healthcare is 1.35% of GDP, expansion is visible in private sector healthcare. There's ongoing capacity expansion in newer geographies and focus markets to cater to the rising demand for healthcare in India. Max Hospitals is a case in point, and so we're very pleased to welcome today Abhay Soi, Chairman and Managing Director of Max Healthcare. Abhay, thanks very much for joining us on NDTV. Great to have you on Serious Business. That is entirely mine. Uh, congratulations on your quarterly, most recent quarterly performance. But we're looking at the big picture first. And I made some broad assertions in my introduction. But from where you're sitting, which is a vantage point, how are you seeing the healthcare space grow, mature, evolve in India? So I think uh, the healthcare space in India has really come of age uh, on uh, multiple counts. Um, if you actually see uh, COVID has really uh, sort of uh, created an awareness of healthcare, an awareness of what sort of facilities were there, the seriousness for healthcare has made people purchase private insurance. The percolation of insurance has been massive over the last couple of years. And that's really provided an impetus uh, to private healthcare in India. Uh, when we look at uh, global medical tourism, that again is a massive sort of opportunity for the Indian healthcare space besides India. Um, what we are seeing is the competitive advantage that India sort of uh, enjoys as far as uh, medical tourism is concerned, both on basis of skill sets as well as the price we do it for, uh, which is perhaps the lowest in the world. Coupled with the fact that uh, uh, manpower, uh, I think we've got skilled, we've, the demographic dividends are really working on our behalf uh, with respect to, I mean, you've got 60% of the population, which is very young, uh, looking for employment, and you've got nurses, doctors, we're the largest producers of nurses, doctors, and medical technicians in the world, the largest exporters, whilst everywhere else in the world there's a massive shortage. I mean, NHS today has a shortage of about 60,000 nurses. You're seeing ma massive, massive sort of uh, uh, supply issues as far as skilled manpower is concerned in the United States. Whilst in India, we don't have any of those problems. So I think, you know, we are, we are sort of, uh, uh, the efficiencies in healthcare have played out. And a lot of these things have sort of played out for the healthcare sector in India. You've set me off in many directions, but I'm going to actually start with the manpower piece one uh, first. Uh, skilled doctors, nurses, sure, currently, India is a sort of source for them, indeed, uh, for geographies like the United Kingdom. But they've got to keep pace with the growing explosion in demand for healthcare facilities in India. Um, looking forward a bit, not here and now, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, is there enough being done to sort of develop an adequate pipeline of such professionals? So I think first and foremost, the government is actually doing a lot as far as skill development is concerned in India. Uh, you know, they're encouraging uh, programs such as Heal in India and Heal by India, in which new nursing colleges are being set up, uh, setting up of medical colleges being encouraged. And you've seen that in the public space. Uh, you know, you've seen announcements uh, towards that in the public space. So all of that is going to help us harness the energy of all the sort of uh, youth that we have in India who are seeking employment. So I don't see uh, a shortage, at least in the next decade or so, but perhaps, uh, you know, as the, the population sort of ages into the future, yes, uh, those, could be, those could be challenges if they're not addressed at this point of time. Okay, so let's talk about Max Healthcare, uh, because it's been a challenging and rewarding sort of chapter for you. I'm going to um, start first with how the integration has been, touch upon that briefly, uh, the review of systems that were already in place, but really elaborate on some of the optimization pieces that you have particularly brought into the equation. Well, uh, you know, Max Healthcare, when we uh, did the acquisition and the subsequent merger, was already a uh, best-in-class performer as far as a lot of things are concerned. 
Um, you know, they had a geographical concentration in the Delhi NCR market, the largest players in the Delhi, in the national capital region, uh, were perhaps uh, the highest occupancy, the best doctors, you know, the best uh, sort of uh, contribution margins. But I think thereafter it sort of uh, lost its way a little bit, at least you know, that was my outside in perspective at that point of time. Uh, so those were indirect cost items and so on and so forth and we worked on those. We were able to sort of uh, within a period of uh, uh, when we did the acquisition, uh, you know, we, we took a check of about $500 million from KKR and we levered the, 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 the company up, uh, you know, we, we borrowed a lot of money, there was about 2300 crores of uh, debt in the company which is about eight times our profitability which is very, very high. Uh, but we were quite sort of uh, uh, aware of the fact that uh, the margins they were operating at were significantly lower than what we were doing in the same market. And uh, you know, we had given ourselves about two years uh, to, uh, uh, to get that right and we said, look, uh, we are operating at 20% margin, they are operating at 8% margin. So uh, in the next two years and we put in all anxieties, apprehensions in place and we said, look, in two years we are going to raise their margins from 8% to about 20%. Well, we were able to do it in 10 months actually. Uh, and then I remember on the, by the 24th of March uh, 2020 and we had entered the company in in June 2019, by 24th of March, we were already hitting about 19% margins. So, you know, we were sitting, we were very sort of this thing, and then COVID struck, and there was this massive sort of, I mean, you're aware at that point of time, you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything was sort of shut down, and we were still sitting on uh, 2,300, 2,400 crores of debt. Uh, you know, the operations that sort of improved at that point of time. Um, through a lot of um, uh, details and you know it's about inches it's not about uh, the major sort of things that we did a lot of small aspects that we sort but of you know at. give me give me two examples of the inches the inches that make a difference when you're looking to streamline and optimize uh, operations like a hospital healthcare chain so you know right from uh, the the nursing which was linked to install capacity. We sort of believed that it should be to occupied capacity in various wards. So, you know, that is something we tinkered around with. Uh, you know, from something as large as that, uh, so that's really your manpower deployment sure. <coughs> across various wards and ICUs and so on. I mean, there's no need to have it for install capacity. You kind of, it's dynamic and you can move with the, uh, so that gives you some leeway right down to a particular credit card company which used to enjoy 10% discounts. Uh, for people when they came to hospitals and that was leading to something I, I remember as small as one and a half crores of uh, sort of discounts that we used to give. Now nobody in my mind chooses a hospital based on a credit card discount but that's the situation it was in. Um, uh, you know so those are I mean literally there were 220 line items okay, okay. and uh, you know in our first presentation it's probably still on a website uh, you know when this is October October 2019 we had called this, we said, look, we, these are 220 line items and these are 240 crores of cost savings at a time when the entire EBITDA of the company was 240 crores. So we were looking to double that and we'll do that in the 20 months, which I mentioned. And then March 20, you know, 24th of March happened and uh, shut down and uh, look, uh, that was another a series of challenges which has started. And we're going to talk about that, but I want to now turn our attention to the here and now as far as Max Healthcare is concerned. Um, You've talked in recent interviews about expansion plans being on track, potential for, uh, you know, adding to existing facilities, the brownfield approach, the build rather than buy. And I'm going to have a couple of questions on that approach. But here and now, what do you have chalked out for Max Healthcare? So we're already operating at very high capacity utilizations of about 76 to 78, 79 percent, depending on the quarter. You know, healthcare is the seasonal business. The first quarter is a low quarter and the fourth quarter is, uh, you know, high occupancy quarter and so on. So we, and this is midnight occupancy. What that means is during the day, we have about 120 percent occupancy in some of our hospitals. Um, so, I mean, these spaces are crying out for, you know, uh, our doctors require more sort of uh, infrastructure over there. There are other doctors who want to join, but we have no OT time to give them. We have no sort of uh, 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 beds for their patients and, you know, uh, so it's becoming challenging. Uh, we've had to move out our offices from these hospitals, move into nearby malls. Uh, so, I mean, what we're doing is elevating a business need, actually. What we're doing is uh, doing brownfields. 
creating hospital facilities or towers adjacent to existing hospitals to tap into our already sort of existing demand. Uh, so that's the first phase and we are building about 2900 beds on a base of 3400 beds that we have and we are doing this over the next three years. So we are constructing uh, you know about uh, 600 beds in Mumbai, uh, no new hospitals been uh, you know commissioned in Mumbai in really in the last 20 years. Uh, we are commissioning about close to 1200 beds in Delhi NCR, places like Patpar Ganj, in Saket, in Gurgaon. Uh, we are building out in Mohali. So these are all adjacent to existing hospitals. Thereafter, I mean, but uh, I think one of the one of the benefits of uh, having the kind of uh, margins uh, that we've been able to sort of uh, uh, ilk out over the last few years has been that we have the cash flows to redeploy more. I mean, at present we are sitting on huge amounts of uh, uh, free cash flows which we're looking to deploy. So we're looking at other cities as well. New cities. New cities. So and just a flavor of how you zero in on some of these new cities. So what we've done is, you know, we're not pioneers, really. Uh, and I keep saying this, uh, you know, we like to do things which others have done, but do it better. Uh, we've actually chalked out a list of 21 cities where at least two or three of our competitors or peers have already proven viability. We intend to do it better like we do at present in perhaps every market, micro market that we operate in. So there are about 21 cities, you know, these are places right from Patna to Lucknow to uh, uh, Kanpur, uh, Bhuvneshwar, Pune, you know, I mean, there's a list of uh, sort of uh, cities that we have. Uh, and these are places where we're looking to, uh, to build out or acquire. And then, you know, if we talk about the new cities, that's not factored into the 2900 no. extra beds, which is coming on stream in the next three years, because that's capacity addition in sort of existing locations, right? Absolutely. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, in these new cities, is there the inorganic option still on the table? Because there's so much uh, anticipation of activity in private healthcare right now in India, sitting here in the middle of 2023, or are you going to just build it yourself? No, so there's always a, uh, you know, there's always that dichotomy build versus buy sort of, uh, uh, the first preference is to buy. Uh, but you know you must get quality assets at the right price and we are very conscious about uh, uh, ROCEs so you know it should be the right asset it should be a place where we can put our board of course you know there could be improvements we can do subsequently but you know it should the infrastructure the location should be good enough for us to sort of put our brand there and I think the second aspect is really uh, that it should be at the right price and when it, that's either of these two things are not possible then we look at building out in those places. But obviously, I think uh, acquisitions gives you a faster sort of uh, uh, start. You've already uh, said quite clearly that, you know, capital for expansion is not a problem. So I'm not going to delve into that in too much detail. Slightly personal turn that I want to take here. What has the healthcare business taught you that all your previous years in turning around businesses in different sectors failed to teach you? So I think, uh, you know, it's about taking half chances, right? Uh, you, know, you take half chances uh, and eventually, and you do your best and eventually destiny sort of reveals itself. You know, I've always believed that even in my, in my, in the previous sort of uh, uh, occasions where I've, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, gone into those opportunities, but it somehow got underlined in the healthcare space. Second is, I think, humility and empathy. Uh, there's a lot which sort of goes on in hospitals. Uh, you, this is the first time, at least, uh, and this is perhaps one of the only uh, industries in which you're, you're dealing with people and life and death situations. And, you know, people when they're very vulnerable. Uh, it's not like a typical FMCG or a B2B business or any other B2C business. So I think those are two things that, or three things that have sort of... Uh, uh, Learned from... Uh operating in the healthcare space. I wanted to make a disclosure here. We've been in college together, St. Stephen's, different departments of Arthur Anderson as well. And the question I wanted to ask you is, what propelled you to take sort of big leaps of faith in a sense, healthcare most markedly, but even before that, you've been fairly adventurous with your career. So Manvi, while, um you were economics honours in St. Stephen's, I was BA pass. Uh, so, you, look, uh, I wasn't a very good student in school. 
and uh, you know, I made my way to St. Stephen's uh, BA pass and at that time I think it was a little easier to get into college, uh, at least in Delhi University. And thereafter when I was actually looking for a job, I couldn't get a job. And, uh, uh, so I knew somebody who knew somebody whose son was uh, a partner at Arthur Anderson and uh, uh, I took up an internship, a three month internship because that's the only sort of job I could get whilst all my other colleagues and friends had full time jobs. I think at that point of time, uh, uh, you know, I decided to level or, you know, it probably came upon me somehow that I w had to level the playing field. I didn't really have capital or a business to sort of fall back on and I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, education uh, at that point of time which would have got me a proper job. So I seized that opportunity and uh, things changed, things turned. Uh, you know, many years later I quit my job, you know, I was still doing well and I, 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 because I got an opportunity in the restructuring space and I sort of grabbed that half opportunity and things changed. When I got into healthcare, uh, you know, uh, post my private equity days, it was a similar sort of situation. I, I got into a hospital which was a non-performing asset, uh, wasn't doing well. Um, you know, of course, I had done a lot of homework before this. So where people see me taking chances, there's a lot of sort of, uh, at least in my head, I was very clear that uh, all the line items, the trial balance, you know, all the ducks were in sort of uh, in, in line and I wasn't taking so much of a chance. And I did that <clears throat> in 2011. Things changed in 2013, 2014. You know, I think uh, I have been the beneficiary of being a product of my time. Uh, there is a huge amount of uh, development agenda which is happening in the country. Uh, we as entrepreneurs today are benefiting from that significantly. Uh, whether it is the global capital space, whether through private equity or public markets. I mean, today when a businessman from India is sitting across the table of any global uh, private equity fund or uh, public market investors, you know, uh, you have that sort of credibility. credibility. Uh, there, is, uh, there is, you know, people are not looking for negatives. They're looking uh, to back uh, stories coming from India. So I think, you know, I've been a beneficiary and we were able to do this with KKR uh, putting in 500 million. Of course, they walked off with uh, 2 billion a couple of years late, later. But that's the opportunity set in India. Yeah. And when we look at healthcare, if I look at my space today, uh, you know, whether it is the Indian demographics, whether it is the development agenda vis-a-vis -vis education skills uh, and skilling up uh, uh, people in India, medical colleges, medical this, you know, the, the focus on heal in India, heal by India, you know, all of this. Is all of these of, are forces that are sort of propelling of, absolutely. Uh, the sector forward. Absolutely. And the opportunity set, I think, you know, today the private sector in India, if you look up all the sort of top hospital chains that you're aware of, you know, Apollo has about 10,500 beds, Manipal has about six to 7,000 beds, then you've got uh, Narayan Hudale with another five to 6,000 beds, you've got Fortis with 4,500 beds. Then you've got Max with 3,500 beds. Then you go into a handful of hospital chain with 2,000 beds. Then a handful of hospital chains with 1,000 beds. And then single hospital. Add it all up. It's not even 75,000 beds for the whole country in the private sector. I mean, really, healthcare in India has been provided by large government hospitals and very small sort of nursing homes, which are, you know, sprinkled across the country, smaller towns, smaller cities, etc. And I think, you know, since COVID, there's been a coming of age as far as the Indian private healthcare sector is concerned. Because, uh, you know, I, I did suspect that prior to that, there was a little bit of a trust deficit, uh, you know, uh, with the private healthcare space that is expensive and, you know, uh, you can be taken for a ride and so on and so forth. But I think during COVID, when- The every, faith got reaffirmed. We got reaffirmed and people were sitting in their homes, uh, you know, I think uh, watching TV while the, while the world was mothballed and protecting themselves. You had private healthcare space, uh, you know, shoulder with shoulder with the government. Okay, people coming to work while, you know, and nurses coming to work, ambulance drivers coming to work, doctors coming to work, the managers coming to work, okay. And they could, each one of them had a potential of taking the infection back home. And these are not people who signed up for the army. Right. And right? yet they came. And yet they came. And through and they, through. Through and through. So I think, you know, that got reaffirmed and... Again, like I said earlier, the awareness, the percolation of insurance, the, just the general per capita income increasing, the middle class sort of rising, the demographic divisions that we have, I mean, it's a great place to be in today. And it's now time for frequently asked questions, questions that are derived from comments of NDTV viewers and subscribers online. So I've had these are going to be very straightforward, simple questions. There is a perception out there that private 
healthcare providers charge more. What's your defense? So I think uh, first and foremost, uh, private healthcare providers charge. Uh, government hospitals where it is free don't charge. It doesn't mean it doesn't cost at government hospitals. It's just that somebody else is paying, it's, you know, sort of subsidized through grants, which is not the case in uh, private healthcare. Secondly, you have to keep in mind the cheapest healthcare in the world today and significantly cheaper, okay, is in India. And the third aspect is, look, if you, I mean, you have very large listed hospital companies now, a lot of companies are listed. And every year in the quarter or in the quarterly results or in the investor uh, results, we all speak about price hikes, which usually happens on the 1st of April. And you, would have, you wouldn't have seen a single situation where price hikes which have been declared have been more than 2 to 2.5% impact on revenues because of price hikes. So it's not a significant uh, increase. What we try to do is uh, usually we have 33%, uh, 34% of our total cost structure is indirect costs, which usually increases by about six, six and a quarter percent every year. The employee cost, we've got 25,000 employees. Um, and when I say 25,000 employees, it includes about 12,000 nurses at $300 uh, a month. Uh, you know, they earn 23,000 rupees uh, uh, a month, which is the lowest in the world. I mean, at the end of the year, you have to increase their salaries. The salaries on average increase by about 7%. All other costs increase by about four and a half to five percent you know baked in everything increases by about six six and a quarter percent every year we need to set this off right right we set this off by taking a price increase do keep in mind if i look at my total occupancy in a hospital 10 percent of our beds are totally free for the poor yes 35 percent of our capacity caters to ex-servicemen central government health scheme employees public sector undertakings and so on and so forth. These rates have not been revised for the last nine years. Presently, the government is revising these. Okay, some revisions have happened in the last month and some more are expected shortly. So that has been flat. Other than that, you've got insurance, which is, you know, and, and everybody else who comes into the hospital, half of them are insurance patients and half of them are self-pay. Now, the burden sort of in some measure comes to them. But eventually, the impact on revenue is only 2.5%. Okay, That's point the taken. increase. There is also a perception, and this is again reflected in some of the comments, that when you walk into a private hospital, perhaps you will be asked to do more tests, perhaps avoidable procedures, or if I can rephrase, more is asked of you rather than less. How do you defend that? So look, if you look at a... Uh, a private sector hospital, and let's say you've got, like I said, 25,000 employees, there are about, uh, let's say, a few hundred people in management, in finance, etc. You've got about 4,000 odd doctors. When you go to a hospital, you're meeting a doctor. A doctor does not get a share of the bill in no private hospital. They get money for surgical procedures or they get money for their visits. No hospital, uh, no hospital would provide inducement to a doctor. It's not legal, it's not moral, and no private sector hospital would be able to do that and get away with it. So you're basically saying that there is no motivation for doctors to prescribe Absolutely. more. They are prescribing what is required. Well, what they think is required. Okay, those are two, just two, but uh, frequent questions and I, I think we've uh, addressed them adequately here on Serious Business. Abhay Soe, thank you so much for your time, for joining us on NDTV, for charting the growth for private healthcare generally and for Max Healthcare in particular. Good to have you. Thank you so much.